Thanks so much for being with us today. You may notice that there's no TV in the background, so I want to make sure that you either pull up the message outline on your app or print a copy out for you. The uh, fill in the blanks on the screen will be back next week. My guess is that most of you have heard or maybe even prayed this prayer and lead us not into temptation. What leads you into temptation? Who leads you into temptation? Do you lead you into temptation? There were many times that Jesus offered a very simple invitation to people. It was just two words. It's the first fill in the blank on your message outline. Jesus' invitation was simple. Follow me. Or another way to put that, allow me to lead you. To which people may say or thought when Jesus offered that invitation, follow me, where? Where are we going? But it wasn't so much about where they were going. It was what Jesus expected the people who followed him, what he expected them to do. And Jesus set the bar high. He never changed this invitation. But by the time of his resurrection, no one was following Jesus. All of his followers had deserted Jesus. They had lost hope when they saw Jesus die on that cross. There was no Messiah to be had, if you would. But after the resurrection, they began to re-follow Jesus. That's what happens when someone predicts their own death and resurrection, and then they pull it off. You pay attention to what they have to say. And that small group of disciples literally, ultimately, would turn the world upside down. Again, Jesus never changed his invitation, but unfortunately, later, the church did. You see, the idea of following Jesus has strings attached. There's some do's and don'ts in following Jesus. There's some saying yes to Jesus and saying no to ourselves. Look at this next fill in the blank. Here's what happened. The church has shifted the invitation from to believe me instead of follow me. And if you think about it just for a moment, the idea of simply believing in someone is far easier. It's less demanding. John 3, 16, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever does what? Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. One of the most unpopular verses in the Bible is Matthew 16, 24. We're told that Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone with Matthew 16, 24, a tattoo of that verse on them. The message of Jesus was suddenly reduced to believing in him. It was kind of like the idea, I want you to believe in me, try to behave, and you'll be just fine. But look at this next fill in the blank. The truth is this. If you're simply a believer, you may not be a follower. You may be more of a consumer in your relationship with Christ. Maybe not a follower. And the chances are you'll probably never pray grown-up prayers. We're in part three of our message series entitled Grown-Up Prayers. Most of us grew up praying, but unfortunately our prayer life didn't grow up with us. The disciples, Jesus' first disciples, discovered this when they began to observe and listen to Jesus pray. And one day they realized something's not right with how we're praying. And they went to Jesus and they asked him, would you teach us how to pray? And Jesus agreed to do that. And Jesus told them things like, don't pray to impress other people. You don't need to repeat the same thing over and over like the length of your prayers will make any difference at all. In fact, he said one thing that really kind of threw them off. He says, your heavenly father already knows what you need before you even ask him. To which some of them may have said something like this. Then why do we even need to pray? But the purpose of prayer is not to inform God of our wants, our needs, or our desires. Look at this next fill in the blank. According to Jesus, the purpose of prayer is to align our wills with God's will. We're to surrender our will to him, not to try to impose our will on God. 
So as Jesus taught the disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, Jesus said this, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The little phrase, hallowed be your name, simply means that we're to pause and we are to acknowledge who we are addressing. The great almighty creator God, the one who has made everything that we see, that infinite God, but yet a God who wants to be intimate in his relationship with us. And Jesus would tell us this, that if we skip what comes next, we may miss what follows as Jesus begins, as he goes on with his prayer. Jesus says, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then he says this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Consumers and users of God never get to this point in their prayer life. And the point Jesus is making to us is this. Jesus says, I want you to stay here. I want you to stay here in prayer until you can say, until you can pray with sincerity, God, your will, not my will, be done. Jesus is not taking prayer requests as we think about it. Often that's exactly how we start our prayers. We tell Jesus all the things we need or want him to do for us. Jesus tells us, though, three things that we're to ask for. He tells us we're to ask for provision, for pardon, and protection. Two of these we covered last week. We'll quickly go over them. Matthew 6, 11, and 12, Jesus says this, Give us today the food that we need. That was our provision. But it was to be done in such a way as a reminder of our dependence upon God that He provide our provision on a daily basis and not just for food. Then in verse 12, Jesus says, pray this way. Forgive us of our wrongs that we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. This, in, this involves the idea of a pardon. We're to pray for our pardon. And I want you to notice that many of you have prayed this prayer over and over and over and never really thought about what the prayer means. But here's when we pray that, that phrase, here's what we're saying. God, I want you to forgive me in the same way and to the same degree that I have forgiven the people who have wronged me. And if we're unwilling to do that, we're literally, Jesus would say, we are a hypocrite. And we looked last week that Jesus, and, and so often what we try to use, what Jesus has done for us is almost like a, kind of like a cleaning product. We spray it on something and we kind of wipe it off and everything suddenly is good. But Jesus is not a cleaning product. And as harsh as it sounds, Jesus says this, if you won't forgive others, I will not forgive you. So often, here's what we forget about forgiveness. Forgiveness is good for you. Forgiveness is not just for the person who's offended us. It is actually good for us. It is freeing for us. And our Heavenly Father, because He's a good Heavenly Father, wants what is good for you and for me. It's almost like He's saying, I want to I make sure you eat your veggies, but I also want to make sure you learn to forgive other people. Then in verse 13, Jesus says this, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the third thing Jesus told us to pray for, and that is our protection from temptation. And if we personalize this just for a moment, it would read something like this, And lead me not into temptation. Let me ask you, have you ever prayed that? God, don't lead me into temptation. Now, we pray for a lot of things. We pray for parking spots. We pray for travel mercies. We pray for good grades. But do we pray, God, don't lead me into temptation? The truth is, you and I cannot be planning to lead ourselves into temptation, as we often do, and yet then pray not to be led into temptation. If we do this, we're nothing more than being hypocritical. Now, here's a fun fact for you. Next, fill in the blank. Did you realize that Jesus was actually led into temptation? And because he was led into temptation, he knew what he was talking about. He had been there, done that. Right after his baptism in Matthew 4, 1, we're told this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Again, he had been there, done that. And for that reason, in Hebrews 4, 15, the writer tells us this. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, but with one exception, he never sinned. About 30 years ago, Janie and I were on a plane flight. I can't even remember where we were going. 
but it was a time when everybody had assigned seats before you ever got on the plane. And we got on that airplane as we were walking to our seats. I, I looked up and all of a sudden I saw the guy who was going to be sitting right behind me and I knew who he was. And you know, when you recognize somebody like that, you kind of stare at him for a moment. I was kind of stunned to see this person. They looked up at me and you could tell uh, that he re realized I had recognized and recognized who he was and kind of nodded to me. I sat down beside Janie. I said, do you know who's sitting right behind me? I said, that is Ken Stabler. And she looked at me like, who? I said, that's the snake, Ken Stabler. He was a famous quarterback at Alabama. He was a left-handed thrower. He went on to play for the Oakland Raiders. In 1977, he led the Raiders to the Super Bowl championship. Well, as soon as I said that, Janie gets up out of her seat. She turns around, gets on her knees like a little rabbit with her hands on the seat, looking over at Ken Stabler and says this, are you the snake? And he looked at her and he kind of laughed. He says, yeah. And she says this, can I see your Super Bowl ring? And he took off his Super Bowl ring and gave it to Janie. And we looked at it for a few moments and gave it back to him. He couldn't have been more gracious to us. But here's the deal. You and I have all seen a bunch of Super Bowls. We know a lot about them. But my guess is none of us have ever participated in a Super Bowl. Ken Stabler had been in a Super Bowl. He knew all about Super Bowls. He could educate us on that. Kind of in the same way what the writer of Hebrews is saying this. Listen, Jesus has been there, done that. He's not talking theory about dealing with sin. He has been tempted in his own life, and he has not sinned. And what he's telling us is this, that he is uniquely able, uniquely qualified to help you and I as we deal with sin in our own lives. That's why the writer in the very next verse, notice what he says in verse 16. He says, so let us then approach the throne of God's grace with confidence. Not confidence in ourselves, but confidence in who Christ is and what Christ has done for us. So let us approach God's throne with grace, with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time and needs. The truth is, all of us live in glass houses. That's why we say we don't throw rocks at each other. We all have areas of weakness in our lives. Satan knows exactly what your weaknesses is. He knows what my weaknesses are as well. And he's constantly tempting us in those areas. I can't go and look at you and say, I can't believe you do that in your life because maybe it's something I don't do. On the other hand, you could look at me and say, well, I can't, Russ, I can't believe you do this because I don't do that. We all have our weak areas. We live in glass houses. We don't throw rocks at one another. Here's an honesty question for you. The next fill in the blank for you. Do you really want to be delivered from temptation? That's an honest question. Do you really want to be delivered from temptation? Or do you want to play the sin now, ask for forgiveness later game? And my guess is we all know this game and probably we've all played it at one time or another. We're being tempted by something. We think, well, you know what? I'm just going to give in to this temptation. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to sin. And then later on, I will ask for forgiveness. It's kind of like when I was growing up, it was a thing in, when I was a, a little boy to carry a rabbit's foot in my pocket. It was a lucky rabbit's foot. And when I would get in trouble or needed something, I would pull out my lucky rabbit's foot and I would rub it. And that would bring me good luck. It's very easy for us to treat God in the same way to treat him like he's some cleaning product that we can spray and, and everything's just okay. We wipe it all away. I want you to know on this fill in the blank, look at it, that this game where we ask for, where we go ahead and sin and then ask for forgiveness, it's assuming that God can be used and he can be manipulated. Again, like a cleaning product. I want you to know that that God does not exist. If he did exist, there's nothing hallowed about that kind of God that would be so easily manipulated. He would certainly not be worth singing to, not worth surrendering our lives to, not worth worshiping or praying to. But what Jesus is saying is this, it's to fill in the blank, you cannot be planning evil and pray to be delivered from it. The word delivered literally means this, to rescue one from danger or to preserve. You see, the reason that you and I lead ourselves into temptation is because we're convinced that it's really not all that dangerous. This is so much easier to see in other people than in our own lives. But if we would step back and look at some other people and see the sin in their life and see the consequences, we would know that it can ruin our life and ruin those that we love the most. So, on your outline, who leads you? What leads you? 
Or why do you lead yourself into temptation? Why are we so prone to lead ourselves there? And there are many different reasons, many, many different reasons. Some would be things like fear, isolation, insecurity, anger, resentment, jealousy, greed, lies, loneliness, isolation, revenge. But look at this fill in the blank. The things that lead us into temptation pretty much could be summarized under, under two headings, protection and gratification. Protection and gratification. Now, please don't misunderstand me. We all need protection. We all need gratification. But they are poor leaders of our lives. If you follow them, they're going to lead you into temptation and they're going to leave you there. They're not going to lift a finger to deliver you from anything, much less from evil. And you and I, if we again think about it, we know this because of our memories, of our scars, of our emotional wounds that we have. Fill in. Self-protection and self-gratification leads us in circles. It's almost like if you've ever seen a video of a dog chasing its tail and just running around endlessly for no purpose, it's never going to happen. We need to understand that these appetites that so tempt us are never fully and finally satisfied. It's almost like the snowball effect. We've all seen pictures of a snowball rolling down a hill and it begins small, but as it rolls down, it picks up momentum and steam and it goes larger and larger and larger. In the same way, these areas of our life that we're so susceptible to, and again, they're unique to each one of us, in these areas, they're never fully and finally satisfied. A good example to understand this may be someone who is an alcoholic. No one starts drinking to become an alcoholic, yet millions of Americans are. They start out drinking just one, maybe one beer and having a good time with their friends. And the next time out, one beer doesn't satisfy. Now it goes to two beers. And as this kind of progresses on, maybe it goes then to hard liquor. Maybe instead of just going out with my buddies on the weekend, I begin to have a beer every other night. And soon it links to a habit, a daily habit in many, many cases and becomes very destructive in our lives. Notice this next fill in the blank. Self-protection and self-gratification leads us into temptation. And eventually it will lead us to ask, Eventually, when we realize it's a dead-end street, when we realize it's not making fulfillment of all the things we thought it would do, when we realize it's not delivering as promised, we finally get to the point where we ask this question, why am I here? In other words, is there any meaning, is there any purpose to my life at all? But the better question to ask is the Jesus question. Instead of asking, why am I here? We need to ask this question. Who am I here for? Who am I here for? If we ask that question, it opens up a whole new world to us. It's incredibly important. Fulfillment and purpose and meaning are always found across the border from what's in it for me. Fill in the blank. Meaning requires that we become a means to an end other than ourselves that we become a means to an end that is other than ourselves. In other words, meaning and purpose require us to say this, no to ourselves so that we can say yes to something better, something bigger. Jesus said, follow me, but notice he warned us as well. In Mark 10, 45, he said, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want you to understand this is where life is found. And many of you know this, you understand it because you have given your life away at some point in some time to someone, some call, some person. And you understood the gratification, the fulfillment that you have in life. So this is where life is found. But if you and I live for ourselves, you will only have yourself to show for yourself in the end. And chances are you may not even like yourself by that time. When people say this, there has to be more to life than this. What they're really saying is this, there has to be more than life than me. And when you get to that point and when you ask that question, there has to be more to life than me, you're exactly correct. There is. When you and I embrace the idea of thy kingdom come, thy will be done, that way of life, we live for more than just ourselves. We live for others and we have others to show for our life. That was Jesus' invitation then. It's also his invitation today as well. 
He invites you and He invites me to a better way of life. If you were with us last week, you may remember that I said this, that following Jesus will make your life better, but it will also make you better at life. The path that leads you away from temptation is saying yes to Jesus' original invitation to follow Him. It's not just believing something. It is way more than that. Unfortunately, many people have reduced the Christian faith to simply a belief system. Notice this. A faith that doesn't change things, that doesn't improve things, is a worthless faith. Jesus was telling a story one time to illustrate this in Matthew 7, 26. He said this, But anyone who hears these words of mine, but he does not put them into practice, they hear it, they have knowledge, they may believe, but they're not following. They're not putting it into practice. He said he's like a foolish man or woman that builds his house on the sand. If you know that story, you remember that the rains and the wind came and that, that house built on the sand did not last. It did not withstand the storms. Following Jesus requires us to surrender. But when we surrender to Jesus, when we're able to come and say to him, thy will be done, there's a promise. And his promise is this. Jesus says, I won't lead you into temptation. I won't leave you chasing your tail or chasing the wind. The reason he won't do that is because simply he loves us. He tells us this, I will lead you to do for other people just as I have done for you. Because that's where life that's truly life is found. So I want to encourage you, don't be content to simply be a believer. Be a follower. Jesus kind of reduced, if you would, all of life maybe to just one commandment that has the potential to change everything in your life and my life. In John 13, 34, Jesus said this, A new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now let me ask you a question that I hope you'll actually give some real thought to. What do you have to show for the temptations that you have given into? What do you have to show for the temptations you've given into? For some, it would be a lack of financial security. For some, it would be a broken marriage that you can't repair. For some, it may be the erosion of joy, the decrease of transparency in our relationships. Maybe for some, if you have, you're trying to hide so many secrets, it's affected you physically as well as your mental health. Maybe you've placed a greater burden on those you care about the most because of your giving in to that temptation. Look at this fill in the blank. We need to understand that when we give in to temptations, you have limited options, you have less freedom, and you have more regret. Temptation is actually the threshold to loss but choosing to follow Jesus is the threshold to life. It's an invitation to put others first. It's an invitation to love. It's an invitation to spend less time looking in the mirror and spending more time looking around me. So why do we pray? The purpose of prayer is to get our hearts in tune with the heart of our Heavenly Father. Look at this fill in the blank. When we pray the way Jesus said we're to pray, it's really a call to surrender. It's an opportunity to recommit to the fact that we are following Jesus. So Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. As we close on your outline, here's just a quick summary that you can use when you pray. I want you to remember that the Lord's Prayer is not a formula, it's just simply a format. Here's four things to remember. We're to address God as our Father. We're to declare His greatness. We are to surrender His will. We are to acknowledge our dependence on God for our provision, our pardon, and our protection. When we pray, we pray from a posture of surrender. We pray our way to surrender, and we pray until we have surrendered our will to God because it's only then when we have fully surrendered our hearts and lives to Jesus that we are His followers. I want you to look at our next steps for today. I'm asking you to consider this. In your prayer time this week, would you say and would you make this commitment to say, I am committing to follow Jesus 
not just to believe in Him, but to follow Him. And then as we've done in the other messages in the series, we're giving you some questions that you'll discuss in your life group. If you're not in a life group, I encourage you to discuss these with someone else to keep the conversation going. Here's the first question. Do you play or have you ever played the sin now, ask for forgiveness later game with God? When did that start? Here's the second question. Can you honestly pray, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil? Does the thought of that create a bit of anxiety in your life, a bit of tension? And the third question is this. This week, would you be willing to organize your prayers around Jesus' model in the summary we looked at above? Let's close in prayer. Father, help us to see the dead ends of our sin and all the things that we think that the, the joy, the satisfaction that they'll bring is simply fool's go. Father, help us to realize that when we pray, Thy will be done in our lives, God, it opens up a whole new world to us. Help us to realize that as we give away our lives, just as You gave away Your life for us, we discover life that is truly life. Help us not to settle for anything less than all that You offer to us, a fullness of life we can never achieve or never have any other way than by surrendering our hearts and lives and following You. It's in Your name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.